just a, a thought or two about it. <laughs> yeah. Really? Well, I mean, it is amazing how complex it is and to put it all down on paper and, and see it there. Um, one of the things that strikes me is how little, how each one of these organisations is a law unto itself. It has nobody questioning or checking on what they're up to and, and Department of Conservation is a really good example of that. We recent, just last week, the, um, minister, the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment put out the report on the long thin eel and its issues and pointed out in that document that Department of Conservation have failed in their task of looking after freshwater fish in New Zealand and, and that, that is a, you know, it's, it's, so, it's so rare to get uh, independent science in this country and the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment is this tiny office of 20 people and, and they put out this, and a really good reading, I really recommend reading that Longfin Eel report. Um, not just because it vindicated all the stuff we've been saying for ages about how we, we should be protecting Longfin Eels, but how that she has the ability to be able to question Ministry for Primary Industries and their total failing um, to accurately um, measure what's happening and, and protect those fish. But, but also that docs had those failings as well. Um, and I guess that this, the issue that comes up all the time for me um, is this clash, I guess, between an introduced fish trout and the impacts it has on our native biodiversity. But on the other hand, if it wasn't for trout and the strength of the likes of um, fish and game, then we would have even worse freshwater quality in New Zealand because the ability to be able to, having that, whenever there's a, a hearing or some process that's trying to decide about freshwater in New Zealand, then the, the only one who's in the room with any money and any resources is Fish and Game, and they have that funding and they are able and, and independent enough to be able to stand up. And so there's these huge biological impacts, but then on the social economic side, then they're so crucial for protecting what we have. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a real, interesting situation because of that, but, but it's about, yeah, there's so much I could go on for a week about all this though, so, Jerry. <laughs> and then a lot of the problems stem from the fact because there's no legal recognition, clear legal recognition of freshwater fish apart from grayling which are extinct. And then sort of had hot little bits all over the place, I mean Lan actually knows more about that, she could talk to her, but I mean eels, eels are sort of protected under biodiversity but it's not clear if DOCA are actually responsible for them or not or are they responsible for them everywhere or are they only responsible for them on DOC land. DOC do manage the white bait fishery but then the white bait fishery is only sort of a relatively small number of fish and then you know when you're talking about other species of galaxies which aren't on DOC land are they responsible for them or not or if you're a private owner who's responsible for it, it just gets really blurry. I mean, a nice example of that is longjaw galaxid up the road from here. As far as I could know, I mean, they're probably New Zealand's most threatened species all over. They, they really only occur in any abundance along about three kilometres of stream. If I want to, I can go up there tomorrow, electrofish and eat more. There's nothing to stop me, as far as I know, in the, in the limit, um, legally from doing that. And I think that's right, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But the, I mean, I don't know if somebody said this, but so we've got the Freshwater Fisheries Act, 1983. Yeah. And if you, if you go and look online, it's, it's amazing. Um, just look it up, and it's in, in, in the Acts of Parliament, and the first statement is that the, there is one species of fish that's totally protected. You may not harm it in any way. And that is the fish that went extinct in 1930. It was last seen in 1930, and in 1983 they passed a law to totally protect it. Then read the second bit, which says that all the native fish are protected except if you want to use them for scientific purposes or human consumption. So, you know, is there anything else? Well, it, it turns out there is one other thing they hadn't, I don't even know if they thought about this, but we've, we've tried to use that legislation. I don't think it would stand up in a court, but we've, we've sort of bullied people into saying, because a huge Im impact on freshwater fish in New Zealand and streams is mechanical clearance. On, on farms and golf courses and all sorts of things where a digger comes along, scoops the substrate out of the, out of the stream and the weeds and everything and dumps it on the bank or on the back of a truck and huge numbers of fish get killed in that process and so we've been able to, because that isn't human consumption and it isn't scientific purposes, then, then they are you know, technically I guess breaking the law. As far as I know, DOC's never actually, it would have to be DOC and no one's used it, but, but apart from that, 
They have no protection whatsoever. The trout and salmon and perch are to some degree tench protected. So they're, they're protected under the Fish and Game Act, so it gets... It's even worse. How would you word that so that they were protected? Um, well, I would say that um, it, for, for human consumption or scientific purposes isn't acceptable. I would give them total protection. So no one can eat them? And yeah, no yeah I mean, I, I, there is you know, other bits of legislation where you can say accept, and, they, and it has got this exception within there for the fisheries for whitebait and, and mm. for you know, eels, there's a bag limit and that kind of thing. It does refer to that, but, but basically no protection other than those kind of things. Mm. Yeah, I'd love to um, chime in just specifically. Um, I think maybe there was a few of you that weren't here at the other class. Is that correct? Well, basically, I mean, to talk purely a little bit about Otago. Um, so we have our white bait species, which are found throughout New Zealand. Um, and there's five galaxid species, which generally make up our white bait catch. But here in Otago, we're in this really special... Um, biodiversity hotspot because of all our random mountain building and river catchment isolations, all these things have gone on, in which we now have um, this whole suite of really rare and endangered galaxids which don't migrate to sea, they're just stuck in the river or stream in which they're in. Um, and out of the whole of New Zealand, Otago is a really, um, it's a really diverse space for these species. Um, the thing about Otago is that um, in terms of looking after these fish um, from DOC or the regional council's um, point of view and actually our actions in looking after these fish, um, we're really dropping the ball and these species are literally like day by day um, trout are getting into these little small areas um, where these fish are remaining because they're just remaining isolated populations above waterfalls where trout haven't been able to get up. And day by day, yesterday was another example um, just in the field, um, trout are getting in and we're losing these populations like boom, boom, boom. And yeah, it just so happens also out of the whole of New Zealand, not only do we have these special fish, but our regional council is particularly terrible <laughs> um, at um, providing any kind of um, plan or um, in their water plan, that kind of thing, um, measures towards actually protecting these galaxids. And that's really the main thing for me. And DOC, um, well, you've probably all heard about DOCs just like going down the toilet in terms of resources and staff and stuff like that. Um, and we're just not doing, like, no one's there. there there's no one who's really there. Um, to actually protect these fish, and there's just a huge gap, and that's so, probably where. So I'm with leaving with there. the regional water plans, what requirement is there under the Resource Management Act to protect native fish? Well, which is what the water plans come under. Yeah, they have um, like they are required technically um, regional councils to provide methods that enhance or maintain biodiversity. Mm. So that in itself should mean there should be a schedule of maps available when people um, apply for resource consents and whatnot. Um, so they can look at those plans and say, oh, I actually do have galaxids on my property. Um, but what's happening on a huge scale in Otago um, is because we also have this situation where we had historically a lot of gold mining which went on. And so we've got historic gold mining water takes all throughout Otago. But under the RMA in 2021, they have to change over to resource consents. So, so like 1,000, 3,000 approximately consents have to change over from these historic mining rights to resource consents. Um, and so people are putting in resource consents, but they don't know the galaxies are there. And so, you know, provided they meet certain criteria, they can take out of water, diversion, they can do anything to the stream which might allow trout into these really rare um, non-migratory galaxid habitats and they just eat them and then they're gone. So that's my main gripe. <laughs> do you want to carry on with the fish or even about water quality generally? Or? 
yeah, sort of what I was going to mention was, I guess, my transition from school into learning about these galaxies and doing a master's and blah, 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 well, native fish in general was the biggest thing that I think sticks in my mind is that you kind of believe, or at least I grew up to believe that you've got regional councils and you've got DOC that have got legislation to protect things and that have got science to back up their assertions. But you've got to look into that science because it's some of it is really shoddy. <laughs> and I think that was one thing that came as a big surprise for me. And it, it's really simple things. And Mike's got some really good examples of um, even the MFE, Ministry for the Environment, averaging averages of averages of averages of averages over all streams in New Zealand or all monitored rivers and saying that there's no problem here. But if you look at the way that they've got that information, it's really basic. Um, basic data that just you wouldn't do in a first year stats paper, you know, like it's, yeah, so you've got to, you've got to look at who's saying what and why and really look at the science and the details of, of all your graphs and all of the things that they present because you'll find little things that don't make sense and when that doesn't make sense you've got to sort of delve a bit deeper and find out more. I think that's probably something that has been the biggest surprise for me anyway in learning all of all of this stuff. I think that comes back to what I was saying before, there's nobody overseeing all of these organisations. So the regional councils report on the state of the environment and the Ministry for the Environment used to report on the state of the environment, they're always reporting on themselves. If I asked you guys to do a report on what you've done this year, I'm sure it would be glowing, you know, telling me what great stuff you've done. And they're doing the same thing. It's only human nature. They're justifying their own positions and they're saying, if your your job is Minister for the Environment or Ministry for the Environment, then you, you don't want to say that the environment's getting worse every year and, and things are really bad. So they always tend to 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 make the positive or or measure things that don't measure the things that do count and do measure the things that don't count and then you can just carry on with status quo. It's always not necessarily a conspiracy, but it's just a lot easier to, to, to not do things, to just keep reporting the same stuff than it is to actually, you know, point out things are bad because you'll, you'll get people uptight and things will, will not go so easily for you. So. But that, that said, with that state of the environment reporting, even with the insensitive statistics they were using, it couldn't hide the fact that <laughs> conditions were deteriorating pretty badly. So the, the government response now is basically to get rid of state of the environment reporting. So I think you know, the strategy has been to shoot the messenger, which when you think about it, is a really effective method for shutting down debate. <laughs> we, should be, we should be getting the next state of the environment report. It was either due end of last year or early this year, but then at the end of last year they quietly announced that they were getting rid of that process. So. You, you don't, what's coming out now are short little what's called report cards which don't have the impact, the press impact that the state of the environment reports have. Um, so I think they've just muzzled the debate. Um, what's the flow on effect for when these trout do get into the stream? Like, I understand that vertical axes get eaten up and that sort of thing, but um, how does the biodiversity of one stream which has trout in it differ from a stream which has got galaxies in it? Uh, very minimal. Um, apart from the lack of galaxies. <laughs> so you see, Colin, Colin, Colin Townsend and Angus McIntosh worked on that, and it's pretty much a replacement of fish species. So you get some changes in behaviour in the mayflies. You get a little bit more algae in the trout stream because things tend to become a little bit more less active. But you have to really look for a, for a change at the invertebrate biodiversity level. So basically it's a replacement of fish species. Yeah, so unfortunately you can't go down the, oh, they've got these really important ecosystem services that yeah. we really need. And that's another issue actually, like trout actually need higher water quality, much higher water quality than galaxids do. Yeah. So in terms of actually fighting for good water quality, it's actually great that trout are in a system, and that's why Fish and Game yeah. have been brilliant at you know succeeding and fighting for good water quality. And, and there isn't actually much of a fishery conflict, because by and large the streams that galaxids live in aren't going to provide it. Trout will live in it but never get bigger than that. So you haven't actually got a fishery issue. So fish and game are a bit mixed. By and, it depends which... Fish and game are a funny, funny agency. They're made up of multiple little um, 
subunits, and the subunits have really difficult, different political outlooks. So if you go to Otago ones and say, look, we haven't got an issue, if you want to wipe out trout from a lot of these streams, I don't think you're going to have much trouble. Um, but if you go and talk to another one in another part of the country, they'll say, oh, no way. It's, it's, it's definitely out of the question. But by and large, there isn't a fishery issue, but there is a trout invasion issue, which are two subtly different things. So there's no laws protecting them. I mean, if you've got one extremist fishery person who just wants to release a couple of trout into a stream for nothing, it's not. It's legally doubtful, isn't it? Yeah, well, you're not allowed to legally yeah. release trout. Fish. I mean, if someone caught yeah. you, you would get fined. Yeah. But yeah, you wouldn't. It wouldn't be because you were eating the last popular. The trout was eating the last population of a species of galaxid, which is just. And it's so hard weird. to stop. I mean, a, a bucket in the back of a car, drive on. Unless you actually caught somebody tipping them in, snap. You're probably not going to be able to do anything legally. So it's very hard to do, and that is an ongoing problem. But also, I guess fishing games an interesting organisation in that it started out being acclimatisation <coughs> societies. So when people came over here, they wanted trout, they wanted it to be, well, they wanted New Zealand to be like England, I guess, mm. and have all of these fish. So they've had to fill in this role um, because they've started having their trout threatened by water quality issues. They've then had to be become a more environmental advocacy group. So some of their officers and some of their people have changed in that role more than others, I guess, and, mm. and they still have that legacy of um, being really pro-trout and... I'll go, you go. Yeah, yeah. I'll go, you go. Yeah. Um, I'm sort of playing devil's advocate here a little bit, but um, if having trout in a stream rather than relax doesn't really affect the biodiversity of the stream, then is the conservation of galaxid sort of more an aesthetic thing or a moral, sort of our moral obligation to protect the natural the natural system as it was before we got here. Are there any other like reasons for spending all this time and effort? Well, I I mean, in terms of like, I'm not a white baiter myself, mm -hmm. but I know a lot of passionate white baiters, you know, all throughout the country, which would be like, if we didn't have white bait, you know, that would be a huge cultural traditional loss. Yeah. Um, you know, just in terms of a recreational activity that they love to do. Um, personally, like, yeah, like sometimes if I'm out talking about galaxids, people will be like, oh, well, yeah, what's their value? And I've, I've really started um, answering that more like, look, I, I can't tell you that you should care about galaxids or love galaxids. Um, but what it's about for me is really just generally out of all our New Zealand fauna, valuing what we have because it's unique and different. Um, and you know, like the kiwi, like anything, like I think, like these galaxids, they are actually incredible to see. We just don't see them. And once you see them, you're like, that is a brilliant creature. Um, and yeah, it's sort of just up to the individual whether that's in their value set personally or not. But also I think those non-migratory ones are kind of a symptom of what's happening all over New Zealand. Like once they go, all, you know, the white bait have got to be next, so it's mm -hmm. kind of just a microcosm of what's happening for the rest of New Zealand. So, you in that just, sense, yeah, see them as a minus canary yeah. is another way, right? Yeah. You know, is that 68% of our native fish are threatened mm -hmm. and on the threatened species list? That's higher than any other country I can find in the world. So, to me, that is such a strong signal that we're doing something wrong, even if you don't give a shit about any of those species, just the fact that you know, more than mm -hmm. two thirds of our species are threatened. Yeah. and it's, yeah. like, I mean, sort of following on from Lance, I mean, I've never bought the argument that we've got a moral obligation on that sort of thing. I actually think it's a crop because the only ones who appreciate nature are us. <laughs> so if we're not here, who values nature? Or well, is it valuable or not? You could debate that. Mm. But I like galaxies. I also fish for trout. I really like trout fishing. But I also like galaxies. And it's marvellous going up to a stream and seeing galaxies. So are there any other values for galaxies? Well, if you look at work like Graham Wallace and John Waters, it's probably told us more about the evolution of southern landscapes than just about any other bit of biota thing. So you've got this huge historic bio um, geography legacy and written in the fish that tells us about how a landscape evolved. It, it tells us um, you know, that we've come from certain parts of the world. It tells us a lot about New Zealand. And 
that's valuable for me, and it's as valuable for me just as trout fishing is valuable for me. And there's, a, there's a funny little bit of me which is sort of grateful that when I'm down on the cliff of fishing that, that they actually introduced trout because it's magnificent. But I'm very <laughs> sad that we've had to lose a lot along the way. And I certainly wouldn't advocate for trout now, but I, I don't want to see the galaxies being lost for my, as much as anything, my own personal reasons. And um, I mean, I think one of the best fish I've ever caught was a giant cockapoo. And coming from Australia, holding a giant cockapoo, I remember catching it and looking at it and thinking, my God, you're a galaxid. <laughs> you're huge! <laughs> and I just couldn't believe that a galaxid could get that large and do that. And again, it's this sort of, you know, you're exploring what's possible within biodiversity. Animals show you, you know, I always thought galaxids got that big, nothing bigger than that. Then you come here and you think, man, no, you can do that with a galaxid. And you can do all the things in a galaxid that a trout does. All the same replicated behaviour tells us something about nature, tells us something about how it all got here. So. If we got rid of trout, would we have a similar industry with fishing? No, no, not at all. It would take 40 years. Uh, when, you, when you read the old descriptions of... It's quite funny, you go back and read the descriptions from the early sort of ex European explorers coming here saying, man, these rivers are fantastic. But there's nothing to catch. <laughs> and, and they come from that culture of fishing. And it's true. I mean, you can fish for eels and you can fish for cockapoo. But as an angler, they just wouldn't. There's just no abundance it, it was, of them. It's a really weird landscape in terms of large well, they're fish. Just, they're so cryptic and they yeah. hide yeah. out right in the substrate and they yeah. only come out at night. They're nocturnal. Yeah. They don't so it's fight and all fly fishing. Yeah. 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 But just also, even, even Māori didn't have any names for... Mm. Kōpū, like so eel they identified like 60 different what they can species but they're just yeah. different life stages or whatever because they were there because they ate them and everything but Kōpū they didn't recognize probably because yeah. they just never really saw them. Yeah. Um, is there an evolutionary reason why they're nocturnal and why they like there aren't any native fish that are had already sort of uh, they're, they're, they're not really nocturnal but it's the same pattern as what you see in trout so if you look at Diel cycles in, in giant cockapoo. It's the big ones are active at night, the small ones are active by day. It varies with temperature. So that it's it, it, giant cockapoo ecologically are almost identical to trout, except they never moved into the large rivers and grew into things that big. Longfinned eels sort of do it, but not in mm. quite the same way. But there is trout definitely moved into a, a vacant ecological niche. There's no doubt about that. So, yes. so what the, the giants in there are more restricted? Just is <laughs> sort of biology. Yeah, I mean, I don't, it, it's odd. I mean, I can understand when you read the, when you read those early letters. I can understand their puzzlement. That's like, why have they got these wonderful rivers and this, there's no big fish leaping up waterfalls in them? Yeah, I mean, part of it could be too that um, our, our rivers are much more flashy in, than most other countries in the world. Much mm -hmm. more, you know, uh, extremes of floods and droughts and all mm -hmm. that kind of thing. That um, <coughs> I, I know that our native fish. You know, I've seen a number of situations where trout have been wiped out completely out of a river after a storm and you can't find them and the native fish are all still fine. They've evolved into those mm -hmm. conditions that, you know, that could be part of the explanation as well. Can I ask a basic biology question? You were talking about the ones trapped above waterfalls. Do all the galaxies have that part of their life cycle where they have to go out to sea and come back? What happens to the ones that are trapped above the waterfalls? <coughs> Jerry, that's <laughs> your one. Um, it, it's really variable. Um, the diadromous ones are sort of a gradient. Some go out to sea, some don't. Um, some, some it's obligate, some it seems to be fairly facultative. Oh, okay. So they, they drift downstream. So if you take Galaxis maculatus, the classic inland, most of them go to sea, but there are the odd population which actually rear in lakes. If you look at something like Kawaro, um, you could really say the almost totally facultative. They'll, they'll rear if they've got the right lake. They drift downstream, hit a lake. If it's food there, they'll grow up into big ones and go back upstream. Okay. And then from them have evolved all the non-diadromous ones, which Lan's working on particularly, which don't go anywhere. And again, even in them, sort of a spectrum of, of dispersal and movement. So some like Aldona and Pollis don't seem to disperse at all. You find the larvae in the same place where you find the adults. Whereas you get something like anomalous and vulgaris actually disperses larvae quite wide distances across the landscapes, and then you get this source sink dynamic going on where some populations are only transient and get eaten by trout, but then other ones randomly establish across the landscape from time to time. So it's a really fluid dynamic thing, and it 
I mean, it's like most things in ecology, you know, when you start to look at it, it's not as, there's lots of subtleties and complexities which make it really interesting, so, yeah. Sounds like good news, though, but, but I mean, I just had this vision of them trapped above a waterfall with all the predators down below. Well, that happens, like that, that, I mean, that happens with the non diodorous ones. You can go to a waterfall and there's a good, good population upstream and, and immediately at the foot of the waterfall there's trout snapping at the base of the waterfall and it only takes somebody to move them up and they're gone within a year. So, right. Yeah. Right. And that's happened. That's been seen over and over. You get the same pattern in Australia, um, South America and uh, South Africa as well. So, you know, the, the arguments that it's not trout is just, sorry, <laughs> it just repeats over the world. Yeah. Matt, that's a really good point to mention the, uh, the maximum flow gains and, and things. So certain certain sectors, I won't say it. Do you want to say it, Lan? No. <laughs> oh, Go for actually, it. saving that they might save save um, galactic populations that are stuck between two trout populations by maintaining the flow by maintaining. Yeah. One might say excessive water. Yeah. So yeah, these these basically these crazy situations all over. Well, not all over Otago, but in some specific catchment specifically, where. Because over time, um, water takes have been so intense, you know, taking pretty much the whole stream um, for irrigation or whatever, um, it's basically created drought isolated populations. So you'll have trout up here, um, a dry area because of water takes taking all the water, galaxids in the middle, and then another water take. Oh no, that doesn't make sense. Anyway, um, basically there's two dry um, sections. And the argument when they're reassessing all these resource consents um, is to actually maintain that taking all the water so that they can protect galaxids downstream so that trout can't get in. Um, and it's just, yeah, these galaxids are sort of existing on this like knife edge population where they don't have any water, but they're surviving there because they're so hardy. And that's meant to be a good conservation outcome. Um, and is this yeah. an argument levied at a council level or an individual group of farmers or who, who's actually um, tweaked onto this? It's it's at a, them, it's it? at a council level, um, but I, I wouldn't say that you know Otago Regional Council are necessarily advocating for that. I think they've sort of honed into it as well. This is good outcomes for conservation and for water t users. Um, they just don't want to fight with the farmers, so they say yeah. keep taking Yeah, I mean, it's a good middle ground. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it is a genuinely difficult issue, isn't it? It's genuinely yeah. difficult. Because if they, if they restore water to the stream, which we would all like to see, the galaxies will go extinct. <laughs> it's simple as that. So if they keep the stream deprived of water in a, in a, in a crappy, low-water, nutrient-rich condition, which isn't good on the water quality front, the galaxies will persist in a tenuous state. So what do you do? What if you took the trout out? Very wow, it's really brilliant. Yeah, it's not easy. It's a really difficult thing to do. Although there's a segue. And so, yeah, so that's another, so yeah. yeah. An ideal thing would be to remove trout from some areas. And some of these areas, are, we're talking really small, like 400 metres of stream or, you know, a K at the most. Um, getting trout out of systems is really difficult. Net, you've got basically netting going in there with nets and trapping fish, um, and also electric fishing um, to get the fish out. You never know, using those methods, if you've actually got all the trout. Um, so another option is poisoning the stream. What do you mean you never know? Surely like if you think you've got them all and then you leave it for a year and no, no more appear? Well, we do have sites um, where we have been in electric fishing, or well, Doc has been, um, for five years. Um, so we'd go in twice a year, these were in Twizel, um, we had a lowland longjaw population there. I think over the five years we got out a hundred and something trout. Every year you'd leave there thinking, we got them, you know, and you'd go back and they're there. But it's just because it's a, you know, it's a water body, there's um, undercut banks, there's weeds, fish can be anywhere. Um, and fish can be, you know, if you leave one in there, that will spawn in there, then the next year you've got all these little ones Two as well. Oh, two yeah. <laughs> you need two. Yeah. <laughs> um, spawn in there, and then the next year you've got hundreds of little guys to eat out as well. And a, and a, a female trout that size will produce several hundred eggs, so 
Yeah, and though the survival will be very high in a system which hasn't got any other fish in it, so you're back to square one very quickly. So, mm. yeah. Is it possible to allow the farmers to, on the really short term, take a whole lot more water and sort of dry out the trout's upper stream so that they have nowhere to live, just short term, long enough for them all to die, yeah, and the up, then the step up, back forward? Yeah, the upper refuges are in high altitude. Uh, tussock grassland, so in some cases, so you're talking places which are up seven, eight hundred metres high, right. so out above the agricultural land. So, I mean, the only, the only way you could do it is like Lan said, you've got to tip a big load of poison in right on the top, yeah. sterilise so the stream all the way down, then put a notch in. How is it dry then between the trout and the galaxies? Is it because water the abstraction? So the stream comes down, there's trout up there, mm -hmm. then you get onto the flatlands, um, so there's trout there. There's galaxies there where it's been desiccated, and then as the water it goes back into the main river, or you get starts getting wet, or the water quality goes up, and you start to see trout there again. The normal situation is there's galaxies up here, and the trout have migrated up yeah. to there. But in these odd situations, you get this reverse pattern. But yeah, they're always vulnerable. Now. But yeah, the point you mentioned, like I mean, you know, farmers technically could do measures like that to get rid of trout from some areas. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that as soon as you're removing trout or doing something to threaten trout, you've got a whole body of people um, saying, oh, that farmer's anti-trout, or if Doc's involved, Doc's anti-trout, and it's really like a huge... Um, people don't like poison. No. So as soon as you say, I'm going to tip a big load of poison into the stream, you get a huge opposition. You've also got the, the thin end of the wedge opposition too, so you, there's certain elements within the trout fishing and within fish and game, not all fish and game, who will, who will you know, fight to the death to yeah. stop <coughs> poisoning of trout. Because once you develop the methods, next first stop the trickle, next stop clue the river. Right. That's sort of the, the mentality. So. What is the poison you use for trout irrigation? The poison's called Rochino, yeah. um, and it's used a lot in marine sampling. They dose reefs with it and then sort of everything pops up Deep. dead. So, so, so you, you, you would apply it like a scorched earth mentality, you would basically purge <coughs> that section of life and then yeah. assume that it would come back. So we trialled it um, for the first time in streams up in Zealandia mm -hmm. in 2010. Uh, so it was a Dock Zealandia and Otago Uni project and we, um, it was really lucky in that situation because it was two streams which ran down into a reservoir. So we could cut off the valves at the reservoir and actually isolate all the poison. So the rotenone came down the streams, killed all the trout, and we had got out the native fish before we put the uh, poison in. Um, poison goes in, kill all the trout, and then put the native fish back in. And the poison rotenone, um, fish are really sensitive to it, like you don't need to use much at all, and it breaks down really quickly as far as toxins breaking down go. Um, but, yeah, again, it is a poison, and so poison and waterway equal hysteria, <laughs> generally. Do you, do you know what the chemical name for it is? No, I don't. I can't remember off the top of my head, but you've probably used it on your cabbages, so it's... Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah dera stuff. Yeah, Because, I mean, I'm assuming it, as soon as it hits the water, it will undergo hydrolysis and... Breaks down, really. It breaks down. Really yeah. you've, got, you've got the problem that, you know... It's a poison, but trust me, it's safe. I'm a scientist. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, it's it, also been mentioned the 1080 of the waterways, which yeah, yeah, you're well yeah, aware of. Yeah. There was, there was concern, uh, particularly in the US a few years ago, that it caused Parkinson's disease. But the connection between Parkinson's disease and rote notes seems to be very tenuous, and no one can really put it down, it's a bit like cell phones and brain cancers, sort of a... That's really not going to stop anyone, is it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems to me that, like, lots of what's happening is kind of just hope, like, hoping that, like, trout might get into a stream and hope, because if you monitor it, I don't know, these isolated pockets once every year or once every two years and the trout gets established in there, you'll come back and nothing will be there. Um, I guess I'm just asking, why not do some insurance populations like on islands where you know that there's no trap? Um, just to have that insurance for inevitably when they do go extinct. Yeah. Well, I guess that's the crazy thing with water. You know, an island is surrounded by a body of water, so trout can get into islands more easily than they can get inland. Um, there are, 
I mean, there are things in certain areas of stream where DOC are focusing on removing trout or they put in barriers, um, usually just a concrete weir, which uh, will stop trout from getting up and protect the galaxids uh, above that section. Uh, but that's, you know, right now, actually we did put a weir in last week, that was one. Um, but it's so, like the way DOC is, uh, with no funding and whatnot, um, it's just not happening. Like it's not like, oh, here's these populations, boom, 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 let's put in these weirs and secure them. It's more like, oh no, we're losing populations. Oh no, we're still losing them. <laughs> and it's no fault of the people, it's just completely under-resourced, there's no one there. Like, I mean, I'm only in this role because I happened to turn up to dock um, a few days before they were deciding on this funding bout that they had. And they were like, oh, you know, you know, maybe you could, you know, apply to do Galaxy work through that. And I did, and that's the only reason I'm here. And there's really nothing else going on. And it's, yeah, sad. There's a, another issue that I wanted to bring up around, you know, extinctions, is that um, I know that there are ecologists who say, oh look, you know, it's all, there's no problem here, we haven't had anything go extinct for ages in this country. The reality is that you'll, you can stop extinctions by putting things in zoos and on mainland islands, which is pretty much what we do now. We just get down to the last few, oh shit, and then we rescue those. And functionally they're extinct, and you can have them sitting on an island, but you've pretty much lost them. You've just got a relic, you might as well have it hanging on a, you know, have a stuffed one in a museum because You've, the, the issue is that you've lost the places that they were naturally in, you know, and so... Well, I guess you'd still have that then until I'm like able to... Well, I guess that's always in the hope. You have that belief that at some stage in the future you could re-release them. But, you know, that th th there's a downside to that in that you put off facing reality because you always think you can put it away for the future. And so it's all right to keep destroying everything because one day we'll be able to put it all back. But in, in reality, you know, there's no sign of us even halting the decline or getting close to halting the decline, let alone ever restoring, you know, that's... Uh... So isn't that heading in that direction then, in the sort of population set that are like, in those, what you're saying, in those patches separated from the trout, isn't that, I mean, they're functionally extinct if that's all that's left? Like, yeah, you're getting... Yeah. Occur, I mean. You're getting to that point with yeah. most of these populations where you've altered the landscape so much and then added these trout into it. Yeah. I th th there is good evidence that a lot of the populations were naturally fragmented as well. Mm. So they, a lot of these headwater fish have that sort of distribution. But there would have been some level of exchange, but there is, there are odd genetic patterns which suggest that even some of the, you know, what are recognised as a single species haven't really exchanged individuals for a long time. But then it varies across species, because some species disperse more than others, so it's this really sort of messy, complex jigsaws type pattern. It was the isolation that formed those species yeah. in the first place. So, I mean, the, the other galaxids, the, the um, you know, the, the white bait fritter ones, are all national populations. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all intermixing around the whole country, or to some extent they are. And Mac so Maculatus is one of the world's most widely distributed fish, because you get that in South America, Australia, and New Zealand. Genetically distinct, but they do, there is some level of exchange occurring, at least between Australia and New Zealand. And the ones that need to One of the, well, one of, one of the things we wonder with giant cockapoo is whether or not there is a source sink dynamic going on and that you have landlocked populations which also export individuals out to sea and they provide your sort of core safe breeding populations and then you have these more tenuous populations which are um, being supplied from recruits from these other places and then if you start to knock out the great big populations like in Waitoon and Lagoon, you then start to see these subsidised populations dropping off down the coast. The technology is there to do it, to test those sort of things, but it's hard to get the funding for it. But I, I suspect, anecdotally, there were a lot of giant cockapoo, say, in Canterbury, but then they almost suddenly disappeared. Whereas on the West Coast, there's still a lot, and you get a lot of these mixed populations which are part diadromous and part non diadromous and I suspect there's sort of complex source sink sort of things going on. So. Is there anything going on in the eco-sanctuaries and the waterways in places like Karori? Where you can possibly cut them off? This, no yeah. one's doing any work there. 
Well, no need really. I mean, if, if you go into Warakanui, there's good populations of bandits, redfin bullies, the occasional giant cockapoo, longfinned eels, they're all there. So the coastal diadromous populations are actually quite good, <laughs> particularly along this part of the coast. And they seem to coexist reasonably well with trout because the trout numbers aren't that high. And Graw is in the same sort of type of stream. So it's, it's more in this back country, highland country where populations are naturally fragmented and, and trout are sort of pushing into. So. Yeah, I think it's quite a different issue, you know, getting away from galaxies with something like long finial, where you have a national population of them intermingling because they all go to one point to breed. You can't rescue those in one place. You have that early effect where you have to have this number, and we don't know what that number mm. is, but they, there has to be a reasonable number of them to go find each other in the ocean and survive predation and all that kind of thing. So you you get a reduction in that, and it's no good. You can have the best habitat in the world in the zoo, but you've lost the process. So the galaxids are so different from that, or these non migratory galaxids are as well. Well, that and also lots of national parks and things where you've got eels are supposedly protected there but to get there all of those all of our national parks pretty much are inland so they've got to run the gauntlet of commercial fishing um water quality the water quality dams all yeah. these sorts of things before they can get there anyway and then they've got to get back down and run the gauntlet on the way out as well so yeah you've got to you've got a massive habitat to protect for diatomous fish Well, it could potentially be great. I mean, there's in the reform there is something which says um, under section six or seven what it turns into, um, actually mentioning indigenous fish specifically and taking out trout and salmon. Now, I don't think uh, the reference to trout and salmon that's currently in the RMA. I don't think taking out the reference to trout and salmon would be a good thing at all. I think. Um, having trout in there is fantastic in terms of water quality and whatnot. Um, but if we could get the reference to indigenous freshwater fish species in there, um, I think that would be brilliant because then you've just got this fundamental core step which then has to filter down through everything else. Um, so if you took trout and salmon out, without a doubt, I don't know so much about the he issue issues here, but in, in the North Island, if it wasn't for fish and game, they do all of the work, they put all of the money up at every hearing that I've been to, the one plan that Horizons have been through, uh, for Lake Taupo of course because trout are so big there, any of the protections that have actually tried to restrict or say they're going to restrict intensification of farming which is the biggest impact, the only one who's out there with the money and doing the work is fish and game. So if you took them out then they wouldn't have a role anymore and that's exactly why they want to take them out of there. Mm. Every, every water conservation order, I think there's 11, was initiated by Fish and Game yeah. to protect rivers and streams. Um, so, you know, the, the thing with trout and salmon is that the, I mean, particularly brown trout, is sort of sadly the now the most ubiquitous fish in New Zealand, and they're also very sensitive to water quality. So, by taking them out, you, you particularly open up the lowland habitats to intensive development, I think. And that's why they want them out. It's obvious. And then the other one, the weakening of the water conservation order legislation is pretty worrying because um, that currently you know, locks up big sections of some really quite major rivers, particularly in Canterbury, and they want to get into the Rangitata, Rangitiki, and the Rangitata and the other one, and start to develop them for water. And there's a lot of frustration amongst the sort of the, the development lobby that they can't touch the waters of some of these rivers. So, yeah, so that would be a big weakening. What really um, does concern me though with the freshwater reform, reforms um, along with the RMA reforms is that um, and what the Land and Water Forum um, are recommending as well is this push towards um, local people managing water at, in local catchment groups which on the face of it sounds great and if we did have you know regional councils and DOC all you know doing their jobs looking after biodiversity um, and so they're at those local tables making those decisions, that would be great. But what I'm really concerned about is um, in rural communities, you know, if the <coughs> community all want development 
and they decide that actually, no, we don't really value galaxids, whether they know they're there or not, um, would be another factor, um, then that's okay. So my real concern is that there's no body that would necessarily be sticking up for fish um, at that level. And um, I think everyone loses because, like for example, we talked about these drought isolated populations on you know, farmers' land or whatever. Um, once these landowners actually learn about the galaxids and find out that they're there, which they've never been told before, more often than not, you know, 95% of the time, they're into it. They're like, we've got these species, tell me about them, what can I learn about them? Um, they want to know about it and they're proud of them and they want to do steps to be able to look after them. So they don't know about them, the public don't know about them, we're not told about them growing up and I think, you know, we're just sort of all getting ripped off, like, we don't know about them and we're losing them and it's, that's not good enough, like, we need to know about them first in schools and whatever, landowners, community meetings, and then we can actually do something about it. But the way it's going now, we're just gonna dis they're just going to disappear and, oh, we used to have these fish, but they're not there anymore. Let's just go on with development and we'll be somehow better off for that. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I was involved in the Land and Water Forum and so at different levels, at Land and Water Forum, where that was that the push towards community participation. You need to understand that the Land and Water Forum was totally dominated like 20 to 1 by industry versus people trying to protect the river. So that's of course what they wanted. And I've seen it happen at community level, both in the Leaders Forum on the Manawatu River and at the, at the next level down working with, with communities. Is that exactly what Land was saying? Where they don't know what they don't, what they don't know. And so they don't know. They're making decisions at, at, the, at each level. The, the people with the loudest voices and the most resources are the developers or the polluters, you know. So they they have, and they have this great argument that, you know, it's great for, for the economy and it's going to employ all these people and, you know, we need more development and all of that stuff that never actually gets questioned. And so you get that, that kind of, um, you know, people not knowing. So the community, ask the community, but the community don't know. So they, they do sell out without even realising that they've sold out and lose so much. You've, you've always got the con problem in conservation too, that, that the battles always have to be refought. But once you lose a species, you've lost it for good. <laughs> but you have to There's constantly no keep defending back, yeah. it. So you're always going backwards. And, and it's almost an inevitable process, if, if particularly people don't care enough about it. So, mm. yeah. so in an ideal world, like we've talked about how this chain of command isn't really working and we don't know who's important to who. I mean, in an ideal world, how would you all like to sort of see that go ahead and who would you like to be making these decisions? In an ideal world, I would like <laughs> <laughs> everyone... Yeah, everyone to know about native fish, that we've actually got these native fish that are unique to New Zealand, especially in Otago, completely unique to Otago. And these communities to know not only where these fish are, um, but a little bit about them, have seen them, and be driving water management based around, you know, actually creating sustainable ecosystems. Like, sure, use the water, but provide for ecosystems. Um, and I, in an ideal world, that would extend completely nationally, like in cities, you know, that's what I feel, I'm, like I grew up in Wellington, far away from anything, you know, rural farming, I know nothing about farming, and, um, and I feel like I, what's that? In your comforts. <laughs> in my comforts, <laughs> purely field related. Um, but yeah, I feel like if I was growing up in Wellington now, and you know, not knowing about these fish, I would feel ripped off. I'd be like, hey, we lost the, all those species in Otago, mm. which were the only species in the world, and someone didn't do their job. And that's DOC, it's Regional Council, it's, I don't know, all of us. But again, in a place like Wellington, like I did my masters in and around all of those streams in Wellington and there are some awesome populations of fish right in the middle of the city because you've got these big valleys that have still got lots of trees and things around them so you've got a resource right there that's so accessible to so many people and taking you know like when we used to go up um, behind Massey there's a really good stream up there and you take the odd school group or care group up 
the spotlight for them at night and people would just like their eyes light up and they go oh I never knew that these were here mm. and they get so excited and they're asking all these questions about how long lived they are and where they go and where they come from and what colours they are and you know and there are our fish are actually really hardy they are hanging on in the middle of city still I mean there's probably I don't know so much about Dunedin but oh, no you can get giant mm. cockapoo yeah. in Anderson's Bay in the drain yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, I, I don't think there's any of the, 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 the... Most of the problems that we face with freshwater now, I don't think any of them are not solvable. Um, mm. And by and large, it's, it's laziness as much as anything. And, I mean, the trout and those up, headwater populations could be protected with a combination of weirs and rotenone, um, severe penalties for those who illegally distribute, get rid of commercial ely, but still retain individual catching for eating. You do the same with Inunga. I don't think you, should, you shouldn't be allowed to sell white bait, but you should be allowed to catch white bait because that keeps a, a resource value. But you shouldn't be allowed to on-sell it and turn it into a de facto commercial fishery. Um, the water quality issues are, are solvable by and large, even even in intensively farmed areas. It's it's either don't care or, or just lazy. And even the cost wouldn't come into it in many cases. It's not that hard to fix. We've got the technology. We're, we're, you're talking about like, preventing um, intensive farming happening, so you're fighting that battle again and again as more and more development comes through. Um, what about old gold mining tailings that we don't know where they are and that are potentially going to kind of like, you can put all of these things into place to protect against, mm. you know, the known villain. Um, but then if you've got a tailings pond that bursts somewhere, then... Yeah, it's, it's, it's not one of the big issues. I mean, it's possible that there is some mercury leaching in in central Otago. Some of the eels populations are quite high there, which is an incentive not to eat them. Right. <laughs> um, but, but apart from the West Coast, I don't think mine tailings are a big issue. I might be wrong a little bit. I've just got a family in central Otago, and they're like, oh, there's tailings all over this. Little, little tailings ponds that... No one knows they were not marked. They weren't yeah. registered. They yeah. weren't. We there did was no resource mm -hmm. consent. We, we, for them. we did a study on eels back when I first came here, yeah. and and some of the eel populations were, well, one eel population in Kaiba was surprisingly high. Really. But whether that's coming from mercury from the gold mining, whether it's coming from geological erosion, natural, don't know. And a lot of eels in in central North Island are very high in mercury because of rain rotorua. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that. That's scary. High so, that's that's yeah. really fun. Yeah. yeah. So, but good to know. <laughs> but that, I mean, if you took it as, at a national scale, it mm. is small in comparison. If you just think about the six and a half million um, cows producing as much waste as 80 million people in this yeah. country, and think of that as the the biggest impact that and sedimentation. And if, if you know, in my ideal world, we would have an inquiry mm. into the value of farming if we actually pulled it apart and looked at what we're doing, what we're gaining from what we're doing, which is very little, and if you actually included the cost, GDP is, is ramped up because we're intensifying farming so much, but if you look at the, what we're selling and take off the interest on all the debt that's on all of those farms in New Zealand, and took off the cost of all the palm kernel, and started to even think about the environmental impacts of seeing we as one country take more than any other country in the world of the palm kernel from palm production. So we are driving a whole lot of environmental issues. If you took uh, greenhouse gas emissions from all of that high level of production, if you started to put these costs onto this and, and actually put the question to as a country, do we want to destroy it for this very minimal income? If we could step back and do that, then, then we would realise that it's just plain stupid what we're doing. But we're just caught up in a in a bubble that we can't like all bubbles we we're in on it and we can't see outside of it and you know until it crashes which it may not be far away from economically then um, we won't realise so that that and then if you if you cut back on that intensification then lakes won't do it quickly but rivers will clean up really quickly think about it that's the pollution that's coming in there you stop the support the source. And, and all of a sudden you've got a clean river again, you know, it happens really quickly, we can do it. The lakes, the lakes are a staggering one too, because you look at, uh, you go to the Mackenzie country and you can start to see the big centre pivots starting to establish. And you sort of think, man, that's really only profiting one or two farmers up there, but the costs of, say, Lake Benmore and Aviemore suffering deteriorations in water quality, and all the downstream cost of then having to treat that water 
and the impact on stock downstream, etc., etc., etc. When I, I haven't got the sums, but I suspect the, the, the value added there is way less than the value lost down there. Well, downstream. even if you just look at the cost of getting nutrients out of a lake once they're in there, like mm. what? Well, we just did some sums for Lake Rotorua. Um, looking at um, twi- uh, shit. $240,000 a kilogram to get nitrogen out of the lake. Um, a tonne, sorry, $240,000 a tonne to get it out. $150 a kilogram to get phosphorus out, and it costs about a dollar to buy the phosphorus. So you're talking about a thousand times you know, the cost. So if you, with those farms, if you went back to the farm and you said, okay, stop using nitrogen, it'll cut the nitrogen loss or the nitrogen that gets into the lake by between 10 and 60%. So it works out about $6,000 a tonne to stop it from going in versus 200, you know, that's the loss to the farmer, versus $240,000 minimum to try and get it out afterwards. And so it's, it's, it's just so obvious that you don't do it. You don't put it in the first place. Same with, with you know, with domestic wastewater systems, the, the impacts that that phosphorus has on the river compared with what it costs you to try and not put it in there, you know, it's just so, it's so obvious, don't put it in there in the first place, it's the cheapest, cheapest option. But no one's, you know, they're not looking at that, apart from a bit of money going into the Rotorua Lakes. And, and I see this happening, it seems to be a bit of a game that's happening over the whole country now, is this talk about restoration, so the deal with Doc and Fonterra, I will clean up mm. these lakes, we'll put $10 million in, into this. Um, the Manawatu River has got $30 million going into a clean-up. Those Rotorua Lakes, two hundred nearly $300 million going in there. Sounds like a lot of money. It's a con. It's just purely public relations. You can't fix something while you're still polluting it. You can't. If Fonterra wants to spend $2 million cleaning up any lake, all they have to do is spend $2 million not farming up there, and you will have much more. You can't. You know, you can, they're trying to do it reverse fix things afterwards it just doesn't happen it's only to convince people that you're doing something it's purely a public relations exercise and and it and it's it's hard to get that across to people because it sounds like they're doing the right thing and the government's saying oh you know doc's going to have to do more of these public you know these this business stuff to do their job but it's 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 not going to work it cannot work A, it's, it kind of builds off that a little bit, but bounces back to the galaxies and the public seeing them and being able to interact and appreciate with them because we've had that success. Do you have examples where that's been really useful at the public? Like things that have gone, that have been tried, where the public's been like, wah, and you see that reaction that you want? Or conversely, places where it's just gone totally wrong because you can learn from either one, where, um, where you're trying to put something out and they're like, let's kill them. <laughs> we, want, we want trout, you know, or something like that. Like, can you give me some examples of either of those? Yeah. Um even like one recently, Nikki came up with me um, to the Kaiburn, which is in Central Otago. Um, was it December? Yeah, mm-hmm. like last year. Um, typically, historically in the Kaiburn, Doc and the landowners there have had a really terrible relationship because of tenure review, legal stuff, court battles, like just terrible. So historically, they generally hate Doc and that kind of extends to whatever work Doc wants to do in the area. So there's um, Central Otago roundheads, which are galaxid species there. Um, and we started going in, Pete, my manager, really had the relationship because he's been to so many irrigation meetings in the area and stuff like that. Um, so we started with this one landowner called um, Phil Smith. And he, you know, it was about showing him the galaxids. So we went out electric fishing um, in, their, in his water races where they're taking the water. Um, it's actually really good rearing habitat for the galaxid juveniles. Um, so that was a real positive, you know, instead of being like, oh, you're taking the water, um, and that we hate that, it's, oh, your water race is actually providing great habitat for galaxids, that's really good. And Nikki was there um, with the cameras, because um, she was going to do a story about the whole Otago situation. And I think it was a quote, he's passionate yeah, about the fish. He said, was it? I should look at the video, but um, yeah, he is. He, he was passionate about the fish and he was happy to work with Doc to 
try to find a way to protect them. Sort of thing. Right. And there's, there's situations all over the show where every landowner we have approached, instead of it being like, you know, not interested, they're so interested because, you know, they are conservationists, they're about, in theory at least, um, you know, getting the best out of their land and a lot of them generally want to value it in terms of um, biodiversity values for future generations. They genuinely want to make that work and they didn't know that these fish were there and now they do and now what can they do to make it better? Mind you, I think that's a little bit of a, like you've got those higher country farmers who have adopted that attitude a lot more readily than your big corporate dairy farms in the lowlands. Mm. So it's a real difference <laughs> yeah. between those two. But then in saying that, we do have a very high profile dairy farmer in North Otago who um, is, we found a spring on his property which is really near um, the lowland long jaw galaxid population. So it's really exciting because um, if we get trout out of his spring, we can put another population of lowland long jaws in there. Um, he's, well, you, you could say it is because he might be having to go to the environment court and that would be a great conservation story. <laughs> but the important thing is that he's, he's on board and he, he really, from you know, what I can tell, genuinely wants to look after these fish. And if he can get something out of it, great. But, um, yeah, I mean, I guess in Otago it is, it is a real, it's a different situation. It, it varies with the species too, doesn't it? I mean, some yeah. the some of the species are right up in high country, and and it's it's not hard to protect them. If you can get the trout yeah. out, you can put a V-notch weir in, and they're safe. And then there's ones like anomalous where they're starting to encroach into the cattle grazing land and trying to get the farmers to keep some of the cows out of some of the and golemoides would be in the same bracket as well. You know, I mean, yeah. there's been streams lost where they've just been trashed by cows. Um, and, and the streams are getting so small that it's actually, it sort of gets into that, are they a stream or not a stream or a drain? And, yeah. and the farmer, you know, you can sort of see their point, I can, you know, it really needs to be protected, but I can see if you fence it off, you're losing a big chunk of your prime paddock. And it's, it's difficult by any measure. Um, and then there's other issues when you move down into the lowlands with a lot of the the native fishing, you're talking about low, lowland rivers, there's a whole issue raft of water quality issues which are genuinely hard to manage because you're now dealing with the whole catchment upstream. Mm -hmm. So it's... it's not like my, my uncle's a farmer and like well my, my grandfather had, it's changing now, um, but he had all his, like all the lowland waterway he mm. just used for crops. He didn't, farm, didn't have any, yeah. any cattle grazing on it. It was all lucerne and hay and stuff like that, which he then fed out yeah. during the winter. and. But now they're grazing on it, and yep. it's like and that causes problems. And the, yeah, then they have to buy lucerne in. It's just like yeah. Yeah. It, it makes for some tense family discussions. <laughs> Imagine. Yeah. yeah. So that water quality thing, I mean, and that again, that's where it gets funny um, when you're thinking about trout as a bad guy half the time. But then when trout is a big guy in terms of being more, uh, an indicator of water quality, then Mike, you were talking before about um, whilst the lapsids might survive a lot of you know, nutrient-rich water sedimentation yeah. is an issue with where it isn't as much for trout. Yeah, and I, I'm not sure, Jerry will know for these um, non-migratory galaxies, but the migratory ones that we worked on um, in the North Island, it turned out that we put radio tags on them and found out where, because they sort of disappear. If you're a, a fishing person with native fish in New Zealand, you realise that there's big populations of these fish in the summertime and then they're gone in the wintertime, and where do they go? So we put radio tags on them and we found that they spent huge, like 90% of their time down in the substrate, down to a metre. So in the spaces between the rocks and the boulders and these higher elevation streams. And so what happens is that because we've wiped the forest off most of the country, that sediment builds up until most of the streams that you look at now are a, a matrix, uh, the odd boulders sitting in a sandy, silty matrix, you know. So all of that, in my analogy, is this um, apartment building. So when all the spaces are there, and we're using these radio tags and picking them up, um, they're, they're, they're sort of on top of each other, two different species in the same space. They really pack into these places like living in an apartment building. Then after this, after you've, in, in other rivers that have catchments that have been cleared, the sediment's built up like most of the rivers in New Zealand. And so then effectively you can't live in the apartment, you can only live on the roof. 
So in this 100 metres of stream, we did really accurate measures over two years. It was about 430 native fish. In a stream that's maybe a metre and a half wide, 100 metres long, 433 native fish living over a year in that stream. And you go to the stream next door that's got the sediment in, and there's, there's one or two or maybe five in a 100 metres of stream at the best. So all of that habitat's been lost. But guess what? We don't measure deposited sediment. The water quality measures talk about suspended sediment. And so all of that impact is not accounted for. And there's a, I mean, I talked about it in the beginning, the things that we, we measure the wrong things and we don't measure the things that we should be measuring. And so that's a whole unknown loss of, of habitat for native fish and, and dams as well. Yeah, Chris, Christoph Mata and Colin Townsend have been working a lot on sediment and, and nutrients. And the one thing that comes out more destructive for streams than anything else is fine sediment. Mm -hmm. It just keeps coming out as the number one. And I don't think it's only loss of habitat, I think it's loss of food as well. So mm -hmm. we've just, we completed an experiment with a um, PhD student and we basically washed the sediment out of the stream. So we got in with hoses and blasted away until the sediment wasn't there. And the two responses we've seen are um, more eels in the sediment clean section, which really surprised me. I mean, with, as soon as the sediment's gone, the eels were in there. Mm -hmm. And the other bit we're seeing is better trout growth. And we suspect there's, there's, there's a boost in the number of invertebrates because mm -hmm. the sediments are clean and there's more food. So you're actually seeing more food for fish as well. And well, I guess it's worth making the point that a lot of native fish actually also coexist quite happily with trout. So it's not only, you know, a lot of the bullies, a lot of the, um, the inunga, a lot of the fish actually seem to be able to coexist. What impact the trout have on them, we don't really know. But the trout aren't driving them extinct. They are actually coexisting. And I think... Get, keeping those, those lowland rivers in good condition, sediment free, low nutrients if possible, um, you, you can have actually trout and you can have a lot of native fish in them too, so it's not necessarily either or. So. I, was, I was just wondering if any of the glyphs, glyphs species eat each other, like if they're a threat to other species. Uh, Kawaro, there's good evidence for Kawaro when you because they can readily landlock, um, you can put a lake on the landscape, and then normally the, you sort of have these populations which are coming up from the sea, and they, they become more and more dispersed as they go inland. If you stick a, a lake on the landscape, that can then form a little inland sea, and they start to breed in that lake, and then they push upstream, and there's populations of Aldona and Polis, which are, are, are threatened up in the catchment up here from Kawara coming up out of Lake Mahinarani. So that's an issue, and through, either through straight out hybridisation or, or predation. And um, big jump cockapoo eat each other. I mean, I, I mean they, don't, I don't know if they probably don't drive anything extinct, but, but galaxids will be piscivorous, given half a chance. So, yeah. But yeah, with one of those populations up behind Lake Maharangi, with the dusky populations, we actually have a koara weir. So like we've actually put in a barrier to try stop koara, one of the white bait species, mm -hmm. from getting up into dusky habitats because they are so that was something well. that I found bizarre. My masters was on, or part of it was on fish passes and getting rid of weirs and barriers because you've got these migratory fish that can't get upstream that get stopped by all these culverts and stuff. And then I come down and start talking to Lan and some of the other guys from Dock and they're all like, yes, we need to put a weir in there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's just a different set of... Yeah. To, um, to illustrate the complexities of it, that... Uh, with the recent Nevis hearing, so Fish and Game applied to have a water conservation order put over the upper Nevis catchment, basically to stop Pioneer um, Energy Company from putting a, a lake in there. So it's Fish and Game applying to protect a habitat from, from dam building for trout fishing. Um, the, the hearing went ahead, the whole issue basically revolved around the key thing that Water conservation order was recommended by the panel because of got a, a variety of galaxid up there. And the concern was that if you put a dam in the Nevis, it will start breeding populations of choir and potentially also tr more trout, which will then push up and start to threaten this particular variant of galaxid up there. Um, so it's a water conservation order funded by Fish and Game. That bit of the work was actually funded by Clever Fisheries Trust, which are sort of a trust mainly for, for trout fishing. Uh, but but it all hinged on protection of the habitat for trout, <laughs> for, for a galaxid, from another galaxid, <laughs> threatening it. Um, and that's now going to Environment Court, it's the Sydney Environment Court now. So, and, and part of the challenge, actually, is the Environment Court challenge can only be challenged on legal grounds, and part of the challenge is Pioneer is challenging fish and games right to advocate for native fish. 
because they should only be advocating for trad. So, <laughs> so it's all quite convoluted. Yeah. And there's another big fear overriding all this that you would have heard, I hope, or I guess that about Environment Canterbury being sacked. So four or five years ago, Nick Smith, the then Environment Minister, sacked the regional council. So you had a democratically elected council that got sacked because they weren't uh, allowing development to happen fast enough. And at the same time, um, Fish and Game Council can be shut down by the government and there is threats to, to be done. So, so when you sack a regional council like that, it doesn't just affect that region. All of the regional councils in New Zealand suddenly think, uh oh shit, if we don't toe the line here, then we're going to get sacked. So suddenly, all of a sudden, rules started being weakened, environments started getting taken out of all of the names of regional councils. Um, and, and, a, and a real, I feel a real change happened after that sacking and that they all felt they were under threat. Fish and Game are pulling back on some of their advocacy work because they've been, they're under threat themselves of being shut down. So at a, at a higher, more sinister level, there is, you know, uh, if anything, um, a, a, a lessening of protection. All around the country with plans, I can see increases in allowances for, for nitrogen being allowed in rivers. They're all all over the place, there's weakening of plans rather than strengthening. So it's, um, there's, there's, there's a whole lot of even more subtle things, I guess, happening at, at other levels as well. One of, one of the first things that the national government did when they got in was to actually um, stop fish and game raising the licence fees. And that really hamstrung them in terms of what they could do legally, because all those legal cases are basically paid for out of fishing licence fees. So. It was interesting, that's what they went for first. It's one of the first things they did, actually. So. Who's, who's breeding all the fry, the trap fry? Like, how, you talk about casual... Oh, well, mostly self-sustaining. Hey? Mostly self-sustaining population. wanted to, to introduce, how, how do they get their hands on the village? So like you can put a net out, put a dip net out, kick around oh. on the gravels in spring, and you'd have a load of traps. Yeah, you know right. the right place. Yeah. Fish and game do maintain some hatcheries. Um, there's one in Canterbury. There's a rainbow trap fishery in the crows. And so there's a couple, but by and large the population is self-sustaining. And, and by, well, I, th I think it's a national policy now that they will not introduce trout into waters where trout currently aren't present. So they won't extend, extend the range of trout, but they do maintain some fisheries on put take basis. So things like Sullivan Stam is stopped from fish, mostly taken from Silver Stream, I think, or, or other where they think the trout is sort of you know, overstocked, they'll move them around a little bit. But they don't extend the population anymore. But some, it does happen illegally. If the trout, they couldn't the trout, wouldn't they just do that themselves? I and mean, if you're sustaining a population in an area, would they just the spread from that base number? They, they, there is probably still some natural spread, but the extent of trout now is probably that the natural spread is more or less over. Um, so the, there's, there's a paper actually by not, Donald Scott who documented the early spread of trout here and it was astounding. So when they first put it in at the leaf of, of note, um, within 10 years it, they pretty much reached all the rivers they were probably ever going to reach around New Zealand from the bottom end and then there's been a slow push upstream. But looking at a target now, there's not many places left where trout couldn't get to naturally. I mean, there, might, there will be the odd waterfall that will push over, but by and large, the natural spread is over. Um, I just wanted to go back to sort of the, the control that National is taking on, the current government are taking on um, freshwater management and sort of the messages that are being put out surrounding it, um, because I think it would be really confusing just from the public's point of view, um, because it all sounds great. Um, because there hasn't hardly been any sort of freshwater legislation, freshwater reform ever, uh, or especially in the last decade. Um, anything that National comes out with is painted as this is a once in a generation opportunity, you know, to really make a difference for our freshwater and make sure it's sustainable. And, you know, the, the first chapter of any document that they'll put out will be oh, they are doing everything right, they are just on it. They know exactly what's going on and they're going to fix it and they're going to make sure it's sustainable. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, it's just the fact that those are the messages that have been put out. 
Um, and you know, they'll they'll say, you know, like for example, one of their uh, great freshwater achievements um, before they were elected last was they were going to put huge subsidies on irrigation takes. So that's a real that was a real win for freshwater. And I don't know if that's just not. It's because it's ninety percent of our water just goes to sea. Like, mm. what does the river need it for? Such a waste. This, this, yeah, it's confusing. Yeah. I mean, there's interesting things going on because the, the, the resource management has got huge deficiencies. Because when one of the big gaps, when you read through all the bits for water, it never mention, mentions um, diffuse inputs. Basically, it's a it's an act that's set up for dealing with with specific uh, consents. So it loses sight of the big picture. So you consent for that, consent for that, consent for that. All the little issues on their own don't really have a big impact. But when you start to put all those consents together, you then start to have a big diffuse impact problem. And the Resource Management Act, was, when it was first set up, obviously never thought about that, never dealt with it. So there's, there's, there's been this sort of encroaching problem. And it, and it caught everybody on the hop, I reckon, with this, the rapid intensification. So National then brought in the National Policy Statement, which is up there. And if you paraphrase that, basically that says to regional councils, things aren't allowed to get worse. Um, you can average across your region, you can let some bits get worse and some bits get better, but on average, you mustn't let get things get worse. So that's positive. But then the, the, the odd things are when you look at what they've done with the um, uh, State of the Environment reporting, they've canned it. So the very mechanism that would let you see whether things are getting worse or better has been the process which they've, they've gone and canned. So on the one hand, you, know, you could say, well, that national policy statement's actually quite powerful in a broad sense, because it's a very broad statement. But then the very thing, the mechanism that potentially would allow you to make it work, they've gone and shot the messengers. So we don't know whether things are getting worse or better now. So there's a real, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the, I think things. that's the point is that it's, it's really clear that the impact of intensification of dairy farming is worsening water quality. The science is unequivocal. It's definitely the process. So you say you want to improve water quality or stop its decline, but then you go and promote the very thing that's causing the problem. Mm. I mean, that's, that's where it is. Yeah. So on, on an average dairy farm, say, about 80% of the impact doesn't come out of pipes. It comes from cows, urine, landing in a little tiny patch on the ground that it can't be taken up by the plants that goes down and into the groundwater and makes its way into the river. Because that's the very issue that isn't covered by the Resource Management Act. What is covered is what happens in the dairy shed where it's collected and then ends up sprayed on the land or river. That's what you need a consent for. You don't need a consent for more cows. So effectively we have a subsidised system where we allow intensification without anyone having to pay the costs of that intensification. Um, I've been working with a guy at Massey who's been working in Europe for the last 30 years. He looked around, we started on number one dairy farm at Massey University, but would go for most farms in New Zealand. He said this farm would not be allowed. It would be shut down overnight if it was in France. Okay, but farmers here are saying, oh, well, those European farmers are all subsidized. But they, instead of having a check being given to farming here, it's just allowed to do what wouldn't be allowed somewhere else. So the, the, it's, not like the, it's not like a handout because if you look at the latest figures from Dairy New Zealand for Canterbury farms, at the moment 37% of Canterbury farms are not economically viable. Okay? And if they have to reduce their nitrogen losses, if you have to start addressing that side issue that hasn't been addressed, if you have to reduce it by 20%, which might go somewhere near to reducing the decline in water quality in Canterbury, then more than half of the farms in Canterbury won't be economically viable. So it, it, it's, it's a day's payout. So we're, we're on this knife edge economically and, and the ecological impacts, if you try to control them on, on a, in a situation where they're almost about to collapse economically, then you know, there is no, there's no winners in this thing is I guess what I'm trying to say. It's mm -hmm. like we get told it's the environment versus the economy so in which case, well, the economy must be good because the environment's stuffed, but, but we don't, you know, it's not better that way either. So it is, you have to kind of look, I always, you know, I can see all these arguments at these levels with all these organisations, but at the bigger level, it's a lack of leadership. It's, it's a situation where 20 years ago, <coughs> you, 
you want to make more money on the farm, the way you make more money is to put more cows on because there is no restriction on doing that. There is no cost on doing that. That's only, you know, you're going to raise your value of your land. And so we've got into this cycle, this trap of incredibly high value land, incredibly high levels of debt, producing the lowest possible value commodity and, and trying to flog it on a, on a world market when you, your land is the dearest and your labour and everything else is the dearest in the world. So, so a lack of leadership, a hands-off approach has, has led to a real crisis that it's really hard to know how we're going to get out of. And, the, and I think this local Galaxy is, you know, issue is, is kind of a, just another one of the little plays that's going on within a, within a bigger context within, within this country. Yeah. And so can that little play, <laughs> do you start small? It gets us back to the communication mm -hmm. angle in terms of, you know, you've expressed how little the public knows about galactids generally. Um, and, and so do you start with, the, this is the beauty and the novelty of galactids, or do you start with the, this is the weird interaction between trout and galactids, or do you talk, you know, do you start with the politics and the policy and what we have to do now? Where would you, where would you start your, your, your individual story. I get, when I grew up in Melbourne, I go back to Melbourne sort of quite regularly, so big city sort of environment. And what, what strikes me now increasingly in Melbourne is just the total urban existence of most people. Mm -hmm. They just don't give a stuff. Yeah. <laughs> they, they're totally isolated from nature. If they go for holidays, yeah. they go to the Gold Coast and go to another urban environment. And, and the food and the drink and the stuff that they eat and consume is basically stuff that comes out of the supermarket. So they don't have any connection or it, real interest in nature other than maybe watching it on telly now. I, think. So it's a, I don't know where you start to tell the truth. And what it comes down to is at the, at the end of the day, not enough people care. I mean, if, 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 if enough people care, then you get something happening. So in the case of something like Kakapo, which are cute and cuddly and big and, and quite dramatic, you do get enough people caring so the resources go into that and it gets publicity on telly. With the Longfind Eel report that came out last week, um, I mean, it's a damning report. It just says everything. It's just terrible. And in the ODT, it had a little column mention about that thing by about that big. So, and, and I think I don't think that just reflects the media. I think that reflects the wider public as well. So, coming from that, each of you cares. And if I could go panel, like each of you, can briefly or whatever. Why do you care? Like that's that's a question I'd like to hear you. Why do you care? Because you care and you represent part of the population that you want to reach. I think I can answer that really simply. I care because I know. Mm -hmm. You know, it's because we know, the other, it, and you don't know, or you only know some of it, so you don't care. Why would you care? Because you don't know there is a problem, and that's when you look at all of these organisations. And what I said right in the beginning is that the reality is, is so covered up of what mm -hmm. what's happening. So status quo is there. And to I, me, that's the key, is that knowledge, you know? I mean, for me, I, I care because I see the world that I grew up with slowly disappearing. Mm -hmm. At a deep personal level, I find just that sad. Mm -hmm. I can't show it to my kids, and I can't go and experience it myself. So, so if, you, if you weren't doing what you were doing, you probably wouldn't know that. I mean, if you were still in Melbourne, you wouldn't be as aware of, of what... Oh, so, oh. I mean, you know because you're out there doing it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's one of the interesting things when I go back to Melbourne now. I mean, I grew up in the outer suburbs of Melbourne, and the environment I grew up in doesn't exist. It, it's, it's been obliterated by urban development, uh, except for a few little parks that we campaigned for. And it's sort of sad that you can sort of see these little remnants of bush, and you just see the urban sprawl going out around. It. So uh, uh, if, if you ask at a personal level, mm -hmm. I just see this, this world that I, I grew up in ceasing to exist. You could lower me into bits of Melbourne now, and I go, <laughs> I don't know where I am. <laughs> I would not have a clue what you'd put me into. It's just completely different. So, yeah. And I guess with the natural world, the sad thing about it is that, yeah, I mean, if you went to a, you burnt a Mona Lisa and it got burnt, okay, you could repaint it again. It wouldn't be the original Mona Lisa, but it would still be a Mona Lisa. You wipe out a particular galaxy or something, that's it. I mean, I, it's sad that the dodo, I would love to have seen a dodo. I would love to see a dodo. <laughs> same. same goes with the mower, same goes we're with all those things. They're gone, all the grain, they're gone. So. Oh, sorry, I felt like there are two people who still didn't. <laughs> I don't want to take up all the time. Though. Well, yeah, I mean I, I mean, I guess I just feel like, yeah, from a personal sense, like, generally, I love New Zealand. And 
exactly what Mike was saying before. It's not like people paint it as green versus growth or green versus economy, whatever. But it's actually the only way to grow is to grow green. And it's not like a greeny thing. It's not like, oh, it's it's like, no, these are the facts. Like I actually, you know, the, the farmers that I'm working with or whatever, like I actually do care about their livelihoods and I, I want the information to be able to say to them, change your land practices in this way, make your product you know, make a product that is higher value by doing this, by, you know, getting away from Frontier or whatever, um, in in order to grow. And and it's like I just yeah, I mean I I've I've mentioned before, like I I really just think the lexins are awesome and that I know about them and that's why I care. But yeah, I am really keen on giving everyone the opportunity to care. Like I just feel like no one even gets the opportunity and that's the thing that I find really upsetting about the whole thing um no one's got the opportunity and they think that it's the that by going towards this way that might actually benefit <coughs> our freshwater ecosystems oh they're going to have to compromise and they're going to have to um you know abandon their practices but actually no that they, they don't have to they just have to change their practices in a way that actually works and then they get more money anyway so yeah, I think the farmers, or especially the big dairy farmers, are, they're kind of just like a little factory worker and they don't even realise it. And they kind of, the, that mentality is brought about probably from our New Zealand's history of growing, of developing based on farms and farmers being, you know, providing a lot of the economy and all of that, and that's great. But now it's it's changed and they're just little pawns in a bigger system and they're kind of being abused in that sense and they don't, I think a lot of time, yeah, they just don't have the opportunity to know because they're getting information from national government, from federated farmers, from fertiliser companies. Um, I was talking to a soil scientist who was up at Clearwaters, um, which is an organic, organic dairy farm and he his old whole idea is is using the biology of the soil to produce um, growth rather than adding fertilizers in. and you can actually do that far more effectively um, from what I could understand from what he was saying than by adding all of these fertilizers and he was saying well why well, asked him where's the problem what what is it where does it stem from and he's saying well it's the fertiliser companies and the farm um, consultants pushing more and more chemicals because they can sell them and they're making money out of it and it's profit, blah, 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 um, onto these farmers. So they just sell them a chemical to fix a problem that another chemical was making, like nitrogen inhibitors are the, the classic example. And his, his sort of quote was, for every farm consultant from a, um, well, a fertiliser company, every, for every one farm consultant that shows some... Um, that's onto it that shows a bit of initiative or shows a bit of spark there's a hundred others with ignition problems like they just they don't have that depth of knowledge for whatever reason to be able to look at the, the problem as a whole so again it's just people not caring or not being out all the information not out there I don't know it's just a big trap, eh? It's just a tr big cycle trap that we're in as a country and we think that's the way that we're, the only way we can grow. And it's just so backward. So, well maybe we'll just end on one, I know you've been sitting in this room for a very long time, especially you, um, Satcom, first years. So, we're going to wrap it up. Some of us are going to go to lunch at the food department or have a hot drink at the food department, so come along if you want to and carry on a little bit of discussion. Um, but maybe, Lan, I remember you described to me, I think maybe it was at Five Forks, so one of the schools that you went up to recently, you, give, you gave the kids a choice of like using an argument, having a mascot or something. Anyway, you gave them a choice between trout and the lax. Oh, and yeah. To just end on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Positive, you know? <laughs> oh, no, that was... um. That was actually out at McAndrew Bay School, just around the peninsula. Um, yeah, classic example. Good, Jenny. Thank you for that. Um, we went out there just on a general, let's see what's in your stream day. I had no idea what would be in their stream. I thought maybe just trout. It's a coastal stream, so there could be native fish there. Um, and they're wanting to do a little stream restoration, whatever. Um, went out, 
electric fish and in you know this these two pools um older you were there uh there were short fin eels red fin bullies and these kids were just they're away and it's it happens everywhere as soon as they see them they just they freak out they are amazed they can't believe it and um but i had been talking to one of the fish and game rangers who was really keen to start up education stuff in schools as well and they've got a program called trout in schools and I was like, oh, well, this could be a, you know, a school that I could just sort of pass on to him to sort of start off. And, and so at the end of the day, I was like, oh, you know, and there's this awesome project called Trout in Schools that you can get a fish tank of trout as eggs and they grow up and hatch. And then you release them into an area where there are trout. And all the kids are just like, do we have to have trout? We don't want trout. Can we have deluxe? It's like, everyone was just like not convinced. They're just like... Why would we want trout? We just, and it's not an anti-trout thing. It's just like these native fish are so much cooler. <laughs> yeah, and that they're just sold. And I, I, if that's the general attitude anywhere. Like they're our native fish. Like we're not really into seagulls. We're into kiwis or kakapo, and that's just what what we do as New Zealanders. So yeah. All right. Well, um, before before we say thanks. Uh, Oh, everyone in 408, can you just come up and get, get so this is your assignment uh, on the paper, <laughs> so all the instructions, and I need you by the end of the day to email me your first choice and your second choice of what group you'd like to be in. But let's thank our um, guest speaker very much.